While sitting at the piano, a pianist can drop the arm to a rest position while the hands dangle free. The fingers are truly resting and the brain can now command an action in any of them. The freedom that it feels at the tip of the fingers could now produce the most meaningful sounds commanded by the mind. Chopin understood that both technical freedom and musical freedom could be obtained with a hand in this state of comfort and readiness. And now, research suggests that our brain uses a standard posture of the hand from which finger actions are more sensitive and efficient. For the piano hand, this efficient posture matches both the rest position of the hand and the arrangement described by Chopin. Of course, gravity has a different effect in a hand at vertical rest from a hand in horizontal rest. The horizontal rest position, when the hand is extended only by the wrist extensor muscles, forms an arch at the tip of the fingers. The fingers keep this wonderful readiness of movement. Their independent flexion is facilitated by gravity but is permanently resisted by an elastic and rather pleasing force that brings the finger back to its reference position. But now, a pressing question comes from all this. If this reference hand position is that good and convenient, why does it take time and work to obtain? Why is it hardly mentioned in today's Piano Academy? For one, the brain can easily learn new reference positions of the hand simply by repeating a posture. If a pianist does not cultivate a proper reference hand position, any systemic and repetitive position may compete for this plastic area of the brain. Secondly, tradition in piano teaching has emphasized the lateral arch of the hand while taking little notice of the axial arch that emerges from a fundamental structure, the carpal tunnel. Acknowledging this arch is tricky, because we are exposed since childhood to a flat disposition at the tip of the fingers. So, Let's build this reference position by following the simplest neuromuscular procedure. In previous videos, we had presented a sequence that begins with the rising of the forearm by recruiting a muscle called brachioradialis, then the rotation of the forearm by use of its pronation muscles, and now the lifting of the hand to its horizontal playing position. At the piano, building this position may feel awkward and tense in the beginning. But given some time and a very attentive practice, and the brain will embrace this predilected arrangement again. In a reference position, fingertips 2, 3 and 4 will match nicely with the higher levels of the black keys, but will obviously reveal a gap with lower white keys. Ideally, any finger should reach the surface of the key which is about to be played. In such case, the learning student must be aware that the finger is doing its job away from its reference position. This is important. An analogy between the reference position of the hand and its elastic freedom of movement can be found in the eyelid neuromotor system. The eyelids have a rest position when partially open and have to do extra work when blinking or sleeping. The keyboard has several levels to be learned by our fingers. Therefore, the reference shape of the hand has to be kept accordingly. 
For example, from its high position over the black keys, the long fingers have to go through an extra distance to play the lower white keys. This is unavoidable, and Chopin took care of providing good exercises to master this difficult task. One healthy way for the brain to relearn a correct hand referent posture is by considering that fingertips 1 and 5 rest spatially below the other fingertips while playing the keyboard. This mind drill will bring attention to finger 1, which is often misunderstood, and finger 5, which is frequently underrated and out of sight.